Chapter Twelve of the Education of Henry Adams by Henry Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve, Eccentricity, eighteen sixty three. Knowledge of human nature is the beginning and end of political education, but several years of arduous study in the neighborhood of Westminster led Henry Adams to think that knowledge of English human nature had little or no value outside of England. In Paris such a habit stood in one's way. In America it roused all the instincts of native jealousy. The English mind was one-sided, eccentric, systematically unsystematic, and logically illogical. The less one knew of it, the better. This heresy, which would scarcely have been allowed to penetrate a Boston mind, it would indeed have been shut out by instinct as a rather foolish exaggeration rested on an experience which Henry Adams gravely thought he had a right to think conclusive, for him. That it should be conclusive for anyone else never occurred to him, since he had no thought of educating anybody else. For him, alone, the less English education he got, the better. For several years, under the keenest incitement to watchfulness, he observed the English mind in contact with itself and other minds. Especially with the American the contact was interesting, because the limits and defects of the American mind were one of the favorite topics of the European. From the old world point of view, the American had no mind. He had an economic thinking machine, which could work only on a fixed line. The American mind exasperated the European, as a buzzsaw might exasperate a pine forest. The English mind disliked the French mind because it was antagonistic, unreasonable perhaps hostile, but recognized it as at least a thought. The American mind was not a thought at all. It was a convention, superficial, narrow, and ignorant, a mere cutting instrument, practical, economical, sharp, and direct. The English themselves hardly conceived that their mind was either economical, sharp, or direct, but the defect that struck most an American was its enormous waste in eccentricity. Americans needed and used their whole energy, and applied it with close economy. But English society was eccentric by law, and for sake of the eccentricity itself. The commonest phrase overheard at an English club or dinner-table was that so-and-so is quite mad. It was no offence to so-and-so. It hardly distinguished him from his fellows. And when applied to a public man, like Gladstone, it was qualified by epithets much more forcible. Eccentricity was so general as to become hereditary distinction. It made the chief charm of English society, as well as its chief terror. The American delighted in Thackeray as a satirist, but Thackeray quite justly maintained that he was not a satirist at all, and that his pictures of English society were exact and good-natured. The American, who could not believe it, fell back on Dickens, who at all events had the vice of exaggeration to extravagance. But Dickens's English audience thought the exaggeration rather in manner or style than in types. Mr. Gladstone himself went to see Southern act Dundreary, and laughed till his face was distorted, not because Dundreary was exaggerated, but because he was ridiculously like the types that Gladstone had seen, or might have seen, in any club in Pall Mall. Society swarmed with exaggerated characters. It contained little else. Often this eccentricity bore all the marks of strength. Perhaps it was actual exuberance of force, a birthmark of genius. Boston thought so. The Bostonian called it national character, native vigor, robustness, honesty, courage. He respected and feared it. British self-assertion, bluff, brutal, blunt as it was, seemed to him a better and nobler thing than the acuteness of the Yankee or the polish of the Parisian. Perhaps he was right. These questions of taste, of feeling, of inheritance, need no settlement. Every one carries his own inch rule of taste, and amuses himself by applying it triumphantly whenever he travels. Whatever others thought, the cleverest Englishmen held that the national eccentricity needed correction, and were beginning to correct it. The savage satires of Dickens and the gentler ridicule of Matthew Arnold against the British middle class were but a part of the rebellion for the middle class were no worse than their neighbors in the eyes of an American in 1863. They were even a very little better, in the sense that one could appeal to their interests, while a university man, like Gladstone, stood outside of argument. 
From none of them could a young American afford to borrow ideas. The private secretary, like every other Bostonian, began by regarding British eccentricity as a force. Contact with it, in the shape of Palmerston, Russell, and Gladstone, made him hesitate. He saw his own national type, his father, Weed, Everts, for instance, deal with the British, and show itself certainly not the weaker, certainly sometimes the stronger. Biased though he were, he could hardly be biased to such a degree as to mistake the effects of force on others, and while labor as he might, Earl Russell and his state papers seemed weak to a secretary, he could not see that they seemed strong to Russell's own followers. Russell might be dishonest, or he might be merely obtuse. The English type might be brutal, or might be only stupid, but strong in either case it was not, nor did it seem strong to Englishmen. Eccentricity was not always a force. Americans were deeply interested in deciding whether it was always a weakness. Evidently, on the hustings or in Parliament, among eccentricities, eccentricity was at home. But in private society the question was not easy to answer. That English society was infinitely more amusing because of its eccentricities, no one denied. Barring the atrocious insolence and brutality which Englishmen, and especially English women, showed to each other, very rarely indeed to foreigners, English society was much more easy and tolerant than American. One might expect to be treated with exquisite courtesy this week, and be totally forgotten the next, but this was the way of the world and education consisted in learning to turn one's back on others with the same unconscious indifference that others showed among themselves. The smart of wounded vanity lasted no long time with a young man about town who had little vanity to smart, and who in his own country would have found himself in no better position. He had nothing to complain of. No one was ever brutal to him. On the contrary, he was much better treated than ever he was likely to be in Boston, let alone New York or Washington and if his reception varied inconceivably between extreme courtesy and extreme neglect, it merely proved that he had become, or was becoming, at home. Not from a sense of personal griefs or disappointments did he labor over this part of the social problem, but only because his education was becoming English, and the further it went, the less it promised. By natural affinity the social eccentrics commonly sympathized with political eccentricity. The English mind took naturally to rebellion, when foreign, and it felt particular confidence in the Southern Confederacy because of its combined attributes, foreign rebellion of English blood, which came nearer ideal eccentricity than could be reached by Poles, Hungarians, Italians, or Frenchmen. All the English eccentrics rushed into the ranks of rebel sympathizers, leaving few but well-balanced minds to attach themselves to the cause of the Union. None of the English leaders on the northern side were marked eccentrics. William E. Forster was a practical, hard-headed Yorkshireman, whose chief ideals in politics took shape as working arrangements on an economical base. Cobden, considering the one-sided conditions of his life, was remarkably well-balanced. John Bright was stronger in his expressions than either of them, but with all his self-assertion he stuck to his point, and his point was practical. He did not, like Gladstone, box the compass of thought, furiously earnest, as Monckton Milnes said, on both sides of every question. He was rather, on the whole, a consistent conservative of the old Commonwealth type, and seldom had to defend inconsistencies. Monckton Milnes himself was regarded as an eccentric, chiefly by those who did not know him, but his fancies and hobbies were only ideas a little in advance of the time. His manner was eccentric, but not his mind, as anyone could see who read a page of his poetry. None of them, except Milnes, was a university man. As a rule, the legation was troubled very little, if at all, by indiscretions, extravagances, or contradictions among its English friends. Their work was always judicious, practical, well-considered, and almost too cautious. The cranks were all rebels, and the list was portentous. Perhaps it might be headed by old Lord Brougham, who had the audacity to appear at a July 4th reception at the legation, led by Joe Parks, and claim his old credit as Attorney General to Mr. Madison. The Church was rebel, but the dissenters were mostly with the Union. The universities were rebel, but the university men who enjoyed most public confidence, like Lord Granville, Sir George Cornwall Lewis, Lord Stanley, Sir George Grey took infinite pains to be neutral for fear of being thought eccentric. 
To most observers, as well as to the Times, the Morning Post, and the Standard, a vast majority of the English people seemed to follow the professional eccentrics. Even the emotional philanthropists took that direction. Lord Shaftesbury and Carlyle, Fowell Buxton, and Gladstone threw their sympathies on the side which they should naturally have opposed, and did so for no reason except their eccentricity. But the canny Scots and Yorkshiremen were cautious. This eccentricity did not mean strength. The proof of it was the mismanagement of the rebel interests. No doubt the first cause of this trouble lay in the Richmond government itself. No one understood why Jefferson Davis chose Mr. Mason as his agent for London at the same time that he made so good a choice as Mr. Slidell for Paris. The Confederacy had plenty of excellent men to send to London, but few who were less fitted than Mason. Possibly Mason had a certain amount of common sense, but he seemed to have nothing else, and in London society he counted merely as one eccentric more. He enjoyed a great opportunity. He might even have figured as a new Benjamin Franklin with all society at his feet. He might have roared as lion of the season, and made the social path of the American minister almost impassable. But Mr. Adams had his usual luck in enemies, who were always his most valuable allies, if his friends only let them alone. Mason was his greatest diplomatic triumph. He had his collision with Palmerston, he drove Russell off the field, he swept the board before Coburn, he overbore Slidell, but he never lifted a finger against Mason, who became his bulwark of a defense. Possibly Jefferson Davis and Mr. Mason shared two defects in common, which might have led them into this serious mistake. Neither could have had much knowledge of the world, and both must have been unconscious of humor. Yet at the same time with Mason, President Davis sent out Slidell to France and Mr. Lamar to Russia. Some twenty years later, in the shifting search for the education he never found, Adams became closely intimate at Washington with Lamar, then Senator from Mississippi, who had grown to be one of the calmest, most reasonable, and most amiable Union men in the United States, and quite unusual in social charm. In 1860 he passed for the worst of Southern fire-eaters, but he was an eccentric by environment, not by nature. Above all his Southern eccentricities he had tact and humor and perhaps this was a reason why Mr. Davis sent him abroad with the others, on a futile mission to St. Petersburg. He would have done better in London, in place of Mason. London society would have delighted in him, his stories would have won success, his manners would have made him loved, his oratory would have swept every audience. Even Monckton Milnes could never have resisted the temptation of having him to breakfast between Lord Shaftesbury and the Bishop of Oxford. Lamar liked to talk of his brief career in diplomacy, but he never spoke of Mason. He never alluded to Confederate management or criticized Jefferson Davis's administration. The subject that amused him was his English allies. At that moment, the early summer of 1863, the rebel party in England were full of confidence and felt strong enough to challenge the American legation to a show of power. They knew better than the legation what they could depend upon that the law officers and commissioners of customs at liverpool dared not prosecute the ironclad ships that palmerston russell and gladstone were ready to recognize the confederacy that the emperor napoleon would offer them every inducement to do it in a manner they owned liverpool and especially the firm of laird who were building their ships the political member of the laird firm was lindsay about whom the whole web of rebel interests clung rams, cruisers, munitions, and confederate loan, social introductions, and parliamentary tactics. The firm of Laird, with a certain dignity, claimed to be champion of England's navy, and public opinion in the summer of 1863 still inclined toward them. Never was there a moment when eccentricity, if it were a force, should have had more value to the rebel interest and the managers must have thought so, for they adopted or accepted as their champion an eccentric of eccentrics, a type of 1820, a sort of brome of Sheffield, notorious for poor judgment and worse temper. Mr. Roebuck had been a tribune of the people, and, like tribunes of most other peoples, in growing old had grown fatuous. He was regarded by the friends of the Union as a rather comical personage, a favorite subject for Punch to laugh at with a bitter tongue and a mind enfeebled even more than common by the political epidemic of egotism. In all England they could have found no opponent better fitted to give away his own case. 
No American man of business would have paid him attention, yet the Lairds, who certainly knew their own affairs best, let Roebuck represent them and take charge of their interests. With Roebuck's doings, the private secretary had no concern except that the minister sent him down to the House of Commons on June 30, 1863, to report the result of Roebuck's motion to recognize the Southern Confederacy. The legation felt no anxiety, having Vicksburg already in its pocket, and Bright and Forster to say so. But the private secretary went down and was admitted under the gallery on the left, to listen with great content, while John Bright, with astonishing force, caught and shook and tossed Roebuck, as a big mastiff shakes a wiry, ill-conditioned, toothless, bad-tempered Yorkshire terrier. The private secretary felt an artistic sympathy with Roebuck, for from time to time, by way of practice, Bright in a friendly way was apt to shake him too, and he knew how it was done. The manner counted for more than the words. The scene was interesting, but the result was not in doubt. All the more sharply was he excited, near the end of 1879 in Washington, by hearing Lamar begin a story after dinner which little by little became dramatic, recalling the scene in the House of Commons. The story, as well as one remembered, began with Lamar's failure to reach St. Petersburg at all, and his consequent detention in Paris, waiting instructions. The motion to recognize the Confederacy was about to be made, and in prospect of the debate Mr. Lindsay collected a party at his villa on the Thames to bring the rebel agents into relations with Roebuck. Lamar was sent for and came. After much conversation of a general sort, such as is the usual object or resource of the English Sunday, Finding himself alone with Roebuck, Lamar, by way of showing interest, bethought himself of John Bright, and asked Roebuck whether he expected Bright to take part in the debate. "'No, sir,' said Roebuck, sententiously. "'Bright and I have met before. It was the old story, the story of the swordfish and the whale. No, sir, Mr. Bright will not cross swords with me again.' Thus assured, Lamar went, with the more confidence, to the house on the appointed evening, and was placed under the gallery, on the right, where he listened to Roebuck and followed the debate with such enjoyment as an experienced debater feels in these contests, until, as he said, he became aware that a man, with a singularly rich voice and imposing manner, had taken the floor, and was giving Roebuck the most deliberate and tremendous pounding he ever witnessed. Until at last, concluded Lamar, it dawned on my mind that the swordfish was getting the worst of it. Lamar told the story in the spirit of a joke against himself rather than against Roebuck, but such jokes must have been unpleasantly common in the experience of the rebel agents. They were surrounded by cranks of the worst English species, who distorted their natural eccentricities and perverted their judgment. Roebuck may have been an extreme case, since he was actually in his dotage, yet this did not prevent the lairds from accepting his lead, or the house from taking him seriously. Extreme eccentricity was no bar in England to extreme confidence. Sometimes it seemed a recommendation, and unless it caused financial loss, it rather helped popularity. The question, whether British eccentricity was ever strength, weighed heavily in the balance of education. That Roebuck should mislead the rebel agents on so strange a point as that of Bright's courage was doubly characteristic, because the southern people themselves had this same barbaric weakness of attributing want of courage to opponents, and owed their ruin chiefly to such ignorance of the world. Bright's courage was almost as irrational as that of the rebels themselves. Everyone knew that he had the courage of a prize-fighter. He struck, in succession, pretty nearly every man in England that could be reached by a blow and when he could not reach the individual he struck the class, or, when the class was too small for him, the whole people of England. At times he had the whole country on his back. He could not act on the defensive, his mind required attack. Even among friends at the dinner-table he talked as though he were denouncing them, or someone else, on a platform. He measured his phrases, built his sentences, cumulated his effects, and pounded his opponents, real or imagined. His humour was glow, like iron at dull heat. His blow was elementary, like the thrash of a whale. One day in early spring, March twenty sixth, 1863, the minister requested his private secretary to attend a trade unions meeting at St. James's Hall, which was the result of Professor Beasley's patient efforts to unite Bright and the trade unions on an American platform. The secretary went to the meeting and made a report, which reposes somewhere on file in the State Department to this day, as harmless as such reports should be, but it contained no mention of what interested young Adams most, 
Bright's psychology. With singular skill and oratorical power, Bright managed, at the outset, in his opening paragraph, to insult or outrage every class of Englishmen commonly considered respectable, and for fear of any escaping he insulted them repeatedly under consecutive heads. The rhetorical effect was tremendous. "'Privilege thinks it has a great interest in the American contest,' he began, in his massive, deliberate tones. "'And every morning, with blatant voice, it comes into our streets and curses the American Republic. Privilege has beheld an afflicting spectacle for many years past. It has beheld thirty million of men, happy and prosperous, without emperors, without king, cheers, without the surroundings of a court, renewed cheers, without nobles, except such as are made by eminence in intellect and virtue, without state bishops and state priests, those vendors of the love that works salvation, cheers, without great armies and great navies, without a great debt and great taxes, and privilege has shuddered at what might happen to old Europe if this great experiment should succeed." End quote. An ingenious man with an inventive mind might have managed, in the same number of lines, to offend more Englishmen than Bright struck in this sentence. But he must have betrayed artifice and hurt his oratory. The audience cheered furiously, and the private secretary felt peace in his much-troubled mind, for he knew how careful the ministry would be once they saw Bright talk Republican principles before trades' unions. But while he did not, like Roebuck, see reason to doubt the courage of a man who, after quarrelling with the trades' unions, quarrelled with all the world outside the trades' unions, he did feel a doubt whether to class Bright as eccentric or conventional. Everyone called Bright un-English, from Lord Palmerston to William E. Forster, but to an American he seemed more English than any of his critics. He was a liberal hater, and what he hated he reviled after the manner of Milton, but he was afraid of no one. He was almost the only man in England, or for that matter in Europe, who hated Palmerston and was not afraid of him, or of the press, or the pulpit, the clubs, or the bench that stood behind him. He loathed the whole fabric of sham religion, sham loyalty, sham aristocracy, and sham socialism. He had the British weakness of believing only in himself and his own conventions. In all this, an American saw, if one may make the distinction, much racial eccentricity, but little that was personal. Bright was singularly well poised, but he used singularly strong language. Long afterwards, in 1880, Adams happened to be living again in London for a season, when James Russell Lowell was transferred there as minister, and, as Adams's relations with Lowell had become closer and more intimate with years, he wanted the new minister to know some of his old friends. Bright was then in the cabinet, and no longer the most radical member even there, but he was still a rare figure in society. He came to dinner, along with Sir Francis Doyle and Sir Robert Cunliffe, and as usual did most of the talking. As usual also he talked of the things most on his mind. Apparently it must have been some reform of the criminal law which the judges opposed that excited him, for at the end of dinner, over the wine, he took possession of the table in his old way, and ended with a superb denunciation of the bench, spoken in his massive manner, as though every word were a hammer, smashing what it struck. Quote, for two hundred years the judges of England sat on the bench, condemning to the penalty of death every man, woman, and child who stole property to the value of five shillings and during all that time not one judge ever remonstrated against the law. We English are a nation of brutes, and ought to be exterminated to the last man." As the party rose from table, and passed into the drawing-room, Adams said to Lowell that Bright was very fine. Yes, replied Lowell, but too violent. Precisely this was the point that Adams doubted. Bright knew his Englishman better than Lowell did, better than England did. He knew that no violence was enough to affect a Somersetshire or Wiltshire peasant. Bright kept his own head cool and clear. He was not excited. He never betrayed excitement. As for his denunciation of the English bench, it was a very old story, not original with him. That the English were a nation of brutes was a commonplace generally admitted by Englishmen and universally accepted by foreigners, while the matter of their extermination could be treated only as unpractical, on their deserts, because they were probably not very much worse than their neighbours. 
Had Bright said that the French, Spaniards, Germans, or Russians were a nation of brutes and ought to be exterminated, no one would have found fault. The whole human race, according to the highest authority, has been exterminated once already for the same reason, and only the rainbow protects them from a repetition of it. What shocked Lowell was that he denounced his own people. Adams felt no moral obligation to defend judges, who, as far as he knew, were the only class of society specially adapted to defend themselves. But he was curious, even anxious, as a point of education, to decide for himself whether Bright's language was violent for its purpose. He thought not. Perhaps Cobden did better by persuasion. But there was another matter. Of course, even Englishmen sometimes complained of being so constantly told that they were brutes and hypocrites, although they were told little else by their censors, and bore it on the whole meekly. But the fact that it was true in the main troubled the ten-pound voter, much less than it troubled Newman, Gladstone, Ruskin, Carlyle, and Matthew Arnold. Bright was personally disliked by his victims, but not distrusted. They never doubted what he would do next, as they did with John Russell, Gladstone, and Disraeli. He betrayed no one, and he never advanced an opinion in practical matters which did not prove to be practical. The class of Englishmen who set out to be the intellectual opposites of Bright seemed to an American bystander the weakest and most eccentric of all. These were the trimmers, the political economists, the anti-slavery and doctrinaire class, the followers of de Tocqueville, and of John Stuart Mill. As a class they were timid, with good reason, and timidity, which is high wisdom and philosophy, sicklies the whole cast of thought in action. Numbers of these men haunted London society, all tending to be free-thinking, but never venturing much freedom of thought. Like the anti-slavery doctrinaires of the forties and fifties, they became mute and useless when slavery struck them in the face. For type of these eccentrics, literature seems to have chosen Henry Reeve, at least to the extent of biography. He was a bulky figure in society, always friendly, good-natured, obliging, and useful, almost as universal as Milne's, and more busy. As editor of the Edinburgh Review, he had authority, and even power, although the Review and the whole Whig doctrinaire school had begun, as the French say, to date, and, of course, the literary and artistic sharpshooters of 1867, like Frank Palgrave, frothed and foamed at the mere mention of Reeve's name. Three-fourths of their fury was due only to his ponderous manner. London society abused its rights of personal criticism by fixing on every too conspicuous figure some word or phrase that stuck to it. Everyone had heard of Mrs. Grote as the origin of the word grotesque. Everyone had laughed at the story of Reeve approaching Mrs. Grote with his usual somewhat florid manner, asking in his literary dialect how her husband, the historian, was. And how is the learned Grotius? "'Pretty well, thank you, Puffendorf.' One winced at the word, as though it were a drawing of foreign. No one would have been more shocked than Reeve, had he been charged with want of moral courage. He proved his courage afterwards by publishing the Greville memoirs, braving the displeasures of the Queen. Yet the Edinburgh Review and its editor avoided taking sides except where sides were already fixed. Americanism would have been bad form in the liberal Edinburgh Review. It would have seemed eccentric even for a Scotchman, and Reeve was a Saxon of Saxons. To an American this attitude of oscillating reserve seemed more eccentric than the reckless hostility of Brougham or Carlyle, and more mischievous, for he never could be sure what preposterous commonplace it might encourage. The sum of these experiences in 1863 left the conviction that eccentricity was weakness. The young American who should adopt English thought was lost. From the facts, the conclusion was correct, yet, as usual, the conclusion was wrong. The years of Palmerston's last cabinet, 1859 to 1865, were avowedly years of truce, of arrested development. The British system, like the French, was in its last stage of decomposition. Never had the British mind shown itself so décousu, so unravelled, at sea, floundering in every sort of historical shipwreck eccentricities had a free field. Contradictions swarmed in state and church. England devoted thirty years of arduous labor to clearing away only a part of the debris. A young American in 1863 could see little or nothing of the future. He might dream, but he could not foretell the suddenness with which the old Europe, with England in its wake, was to vanish in 1870. He was in dead water, 
and the party-coloured fantastic cranks swam about his boat, as though he were the ancient mariner, and they saurians of the prime. End of chapter 12